Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Ostman. Uh, Stephanie Saba and I are so excited to have you all here today to talk about Book Club Reboot, creative twists on the reading groups we know and love. Today's webinar is a presentation of the American Library Association's Public Programs Office. We're able to offer today's webinar for free thanks to ALA's Cultural Communities Fund. You can support the Cultural Communities Fund with a gift of any size. To learn more, visit ala.org slash ccf. Many of you have probably heard about our website, Programming Librarian. Um, if not, it's probably right up your alley. Um, if you'd like to watch more programming-related webinars like this one, to go uh, visit programminglibrarian.org and check out our learning section. We also have hundreds of program ideas, um, grant offerings, and the like. And if you don't receive our Programming Librarian newsletter, um, I would encourage you all to sign up. Uh, it's very easy, programminglibrarian.org slash newsletter. And we will drop that URL for you uh, in the chat box right now. A little bit of uh, technical information about the webinar today. Only Stephanie and I, the presenters, have microphone access, but we hope you'll make good use of that chat box uh, to let us know your comments and questions. Hopefully most of you have already introduced yourselves. Um, if not, do familiarize yourself with how to open that chat box and uh, let us know your name and where you're joining us from. If you have any technical issues, uh, please use the Q&A window to communicate with ALA staff. That message will reach Brian. To send a message through the Q&A feature, move your cursor to the bottom of the Zoom window and click on Q&A. Um, we ask you to not put technical questions in the chat window in case that window gets very busy. Um, it may be hard for us to uh, find your technical questions in the mix. And finally, just note that this se session will be recorded. Um, the link will be available on programminglibrarian.org later today in the learning section. So it's time for introductions. Stephanie Saba is a community program supervisor at San Mateo County Libraries in California. Over the last 15 years, she has led book clubs in three different communities, including two 2030-something book clubs, a mother-daughter book club, an adult book club, and a senior book club. As for me, I am the communications manager in ALA's public programs office, and I'm also the editor of programminglibrarian.org. Prior to joining ALA in 2014, um, I had a background in writing and editing, working as a newspaper reporter, editor, and science writer. And most importantly for today's webinar, Stephanie and I are also the co-authors of Book Club Reboot, 71 Creative Twists, which was published earlier this year by ALA Editions. Um, in the next 45 minutes or so, 55 minutes or so, we're going to be sharing some snippets from the book. Um, but if you'd like to buy a copy, you can do so at the link on your screen at the ALA store. Um, or just Google Book Club Reboot. Um, and if you do buy a copy, there's a coupon code on your screen, BCRB19, that will give you $5 off. Here is our very simple outline for the next 55 minutes. We're going to give a bit of introduction, then we'll talk about a few of the clubs that we feature in the book in a little more depth, and then we will reserve some time at the end for your questions. If, as we're talking, please feel free to uh, type your questions into the chat box. We'll try to respond to them as we go along. If we don't manage to do that, we will bring them up at, in the Q&A at the back at the uh, end of the hour. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Stephanie. Hello, everyone. Um, so the idea for this book actually came out of my own experiences with book clubs. As Sarah mentioned, I run seven book clubs for a variety of age groups in three extremely different communities. And I'd like to start by sharing a story from the second book club I facilitated. So after leading a successful 2030-something book club at my first library job, I transferred to another branch in our system. My boss had been running a book club at the local senior center and asked me to take it over since I had prior book club experience. I was already a little nervous about leading this book club. I was only 23 years old and heading into an established book club where the majority of members were over the age of 70. My boss also decided it was time to mix up the book club and try something new. So she purchased e-readers for all of the members and preloaded them with the books for the next few months.
Needless to say, while the members of the book club warmly welcomed me into the group, despite our massive age difference, they were not thrilled with the e-readers. Most of the members brought the e-readers back after a month and refused to continue trying to use them. We did have one or two people who stuck with them, but the vast majority rejected the new technology. Even though the technology wasn't a hit, I thoroughly enjoyed running this book club for the next few years. I introduced the members to young adult titles that they loved, and I found that the conversations we had were rich and meaningful, particularly when I strayed away from the traditional book club discussion questions. The lesson I learned here is even if you try something new and it turns out to be an epic fail, that doesn't mean that you failed completely. In this case, it opened the door for a discussion about what the book club members actually wanted. While they weren't open to the new technology, they were interested in broadening their reading horizons with new genres like young adult literature. So this slide here, um, these are all actual comments from the Programming Librarian Facebook group. If you are currently struggling with your book club, you're not alone. Many of the libraries we included in our book grew their successful book clubs out of groups that were failing and needed a reboot. And sometimes even a successful idea can be hard to replicate in another library setting. I had a really successful 2030-something book club at one branch, but when I tried to replicate it at another branch in our system, I couldn't maintain the momentum of the group. So according to the New York Times, 5 million Americans belong to a book club. If you're struggling with attendance at your own book club, you may be wondering, where are all these people? This is a question we asked ourselves when we started writing this book. This can be a really difficult um, situation to be in, especially if you're excited about bringing a book club to your community. But there is hope. Remember that the definition of successful varies from library to library. Try not to compare your book club to other library book clubs. Every community is unique, and your book club will be too. I'm going to turn this over to Sarah now, who will, walk you, who will talk, you, uh, talk to you about why you might want to make some changes to your own book club. Thanks, Stephanie. So um, I just want to start by saying there is nothing wrong with a traditional book club. And I hope we make this very clear in the book. If, if your library has an engaged group of readers, or just has a plain run-of-the-mill book club that is helping your library meet its goals in some way or another, by all means, keep doing what you're doing. Um, however, there are a few reasons why you might want to change things up, and we're going to dive into a couple of those now. And the first is probably the most obvious. Um, people aren't coming, and there's the sad book club leader all by themselves in the room. This is probably the biggest culprit that we heard about. Um, you and your library staff members are putting in the prep time, you're doing the marketing, and still people aren't showing up. Or in other circumstances, uh, the book club might have started off strong, but things got stale or something changed and people just stopped coming. Um, that poor turnout is a big bummer, don't get me wrong. Um, it can make for some very awkward forced uh, facilitation, some forced conversations between you and the few regulars that are still coming. Um, but if there is a silver lining, it's that your patrons have sort of made the decision for you. Um, so now you know what's not working, you just need to decide what to do next. Second reason to change up your book club is that you're burned out, too busy, or bored. And this is a little bit about self-care, <laughs> because how you're feeling is a big factor here, too. We don't want your book club to take up an unreasonable amount of your time, and you don't want them to leave you feeling completely drained at the end of the day. If you're short on time, there are book club formats that require less of your time and energy. Um, and we do go into a couple of those in the book. There are uh, book clubs that have no required reading, book clubs that are facilitated by partner organizations, book clubs that only meet for part of the year. All of these are options that will free up your time a little bit to do all of the other things that we all have in our workload. Or at the other end of the spectrum, if you're just bored with the situation, you might opt for a book club that requires tons and tons of extra research and preparation, but it's something that you're really passionate about, so you care enough to really put in the extra time and energy. And that's really up to you and your supervisors. The third meeting, uh, reason you might want to change up your book club is that it's not meeting your community's needs. Um, now, I'm not suggesting that we all go out and do a giant needs assessment about this, though if you have done one, that's fantastic. That's data that you can certainly use. But we do want to give some thought to what people in your community want and need right now. 
and that requires a little bit of intuition, um, but more so it requires just listening to people. Denver Public has a really great example of a book club that has done this. Following the deaths of Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown, uh, librarians were hearing from a lot of their patrons that they wanted a place to come and discuss race and social justice issues. Um, so they created a book discussion series that travels the city discussing issues just like that. And the fourth reason you might want to change up your book club is that your meeting time or location just aren't working out. These logistical issues happen to everybody. Um, they might require you to make a change. If your library's parking garage is under construction for the next year and most of your book club members rely on their cars to get to you, you might need to change something up. Um, so you might need to look at a new location um, or do something uh, online. So you've decided it's time to change up your book club. What now? First step is going to be to ask yourself, um, and maybe again your coworkers or your supervisor, some questions to figure out what to do next. In the book, we have a full page of questions uh, to get you started thinking about this, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to mention a few topics that you'll want to think about. Um, one is your target audience. Is there a particular social group or subculture or fan fiction group that is going unserved in your community? Are there any holes in your library's programming that a new book club could fill? Do you have enough offerings for teens, people in their 20s and 30s, older adults, or people with special needs? Um, one public librarian I talked to in Michigan decided to start a book club specifically for city employees. Um, she was talking to some and realized that that was um, an audience that they were not serving. And it was especially convenient because they all worked close together on the city hall campus and they could meet over lunch on Fridays. Another thing to think about um, as you are deciding what to do next are your assets. And by that, I mean not just your library's assets, but also your community's assets. Are there any unique aspects about your community's geography, history, culture, anything that you could latch onto and jump off of for an interesting book club? Uh, is there a unique meeting space or is there a brand new restaurant or bar that people are really itching to get into? And finally, you'll need to think about time and staffing, which are always an issue. Uh, what level of staff commitment can your library offer? Do you need a book club that minimizes prep time? Do you need to find a volunteer to facilitate the group? All things to consider. Now we're going to talk some about the uh, book clubs featured in the book, and I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie for the first section. Yes. So um, the way that we kind of started our process was that Sarah and I created a survey in the spring um, of 2018 and then asked library staff to share some information about their unique book clubs. We shared the survey through ALA's Programming Librarian Interest Group, the Public and Cultural Advisory Committee, social media, electronic mailing lists, and targeted outreach. Within 25 minutes, we had received 18 submissions, and overall, we received over 270 responses. I think we were both expecting it to be difficult to get people to respond to the survey, but it was actually much harder to narrow down all of our entries. So this is a list of all of the book clubs we featured in our book. In order to get to this point, we started by reading through all of the submissions and grouping them into categories. Um, for example, we had a category for cookbook clubs because we received over 30 submissions that were all uh, book clubs that um, tried recipes from various cookbooks. We wanted each book club feature to have something that stood out and made them different than other book clubs out there, so that definitely helped us to narrow down the list significantly. Once we had a smaller list, we approached all of the book clubs we wanted to feature with a second survey that asked for more detailed information about their group. When we received the second round of surveys back, we compiled the book clubs into common themes, which became the chapters in the book. This was also challenging at times because some of the book clubs we featured could have easily fit into more than one chapter. So we're each going to share um, two of our favorite chapters and a couple of book clubs from those chapters. Um, and I'm going to start with um, the Unite People with Common Interest chapter. So this is one of my favorite chapters to write. We got so many fascinating entries that fit into this category. 
The themes varied widely, but all of the groups took a shared passion and turned it into a really interesting and unique book club. The Bushwick Book Club Seattle is run by Bushwick Northwest, which is a nonprofit organization in Seattle. The members have been meeting for eight years to perform original music inspired by that month's book in front of a live audience. I got to actually sit in on a meeting during midwinter this year. They had read a James Baldwin book and invited a local professor to give an introduction to the book and a background of the time period. The talk was followed by performances from all of the members, and the energy in the room was incredible and so inspiring. You could tell the community really looked forward to the monthly events and that these were a major social highlight on their calendar. Another one of my favorites from this chapter is the Running and Reading Book Club, and it's run by Rye Public Library in New Hampshire. They discuss one book over the course of six weekly meetings, and then they follow their book discussion with a run. Beginning and season runners are all invited to participate, and they're training to participate in a local race and have achieved many personal milestones along the way. I love the concept for this book club. Um, running is often a solo activity, but this gives people a chance to connect with other runners, and it also creates a cheer squad for each person as they achieve their personal race goals. That being said, this is the only book club we included that I would not be eager to join. Um, I did a 10K one time, and while I'm proud of that achievement, I don't think I would want to do it regularly. This is Sarah, and I'm now going to give a couple of examples from our Meet a Need chapter, um, which looked at book clubs that are particularly good at meeting a community need. The Oasis Book Club um, is a book club based in Boston, um, run by an organization called the o Oasis Coalition of Boston, um, and they serve uh, people experiencing homelessness. It was created in 2009 um, when a lawyer named Peter Resnick struck up a conversation with a homeless veteran named Rob Day. Um, Rod had been spending his nights in Boston Common, and through their conversations, Peter learned that lo uh, Rob loved to read. So he started giving him books and they would talk about them in the mornings on uh, Peter's walk to work. So one day on their third or fourth book, Peter asked Rob what had become of the books he'd been giving him so far. And it turns out that Rob had been giving them to other members of you know, his friends and other members of the homeless community. And they'd been passed from person to person who'd been reading them and passing them along. So this gave Peter the idea of creating a book club um, for the homeless people. The club today meets weekly at a church. Um, the meeting format is free form. Uh, the club typically spends a couple of weeks on each book that they read. Um, if everyone has read the title, they'll have a regular book club discussion. Other times, they'll just sit together and read the chapters aloud. Um, members can keep the books when they're finished. Um, and many of the books are donated by authors or by other book clubs after they're done with them. Um, one suggestion if you're interested in this sort of book club, if you do a web search for Oasis Book Club and you get to their website, they link to a document um, that they've created with suggestions about running book clubs for the homeless community. And I really suggest you check it out. Um, there's some just really helpful tips that um, might be no brainers, but things that make a lot of sense, things that I had never thought of. For example, if you want to have a book club for the homeless community, make sure not to use hardcovers. You always want to use paperbacks just because they're so much easier to carry around. The next Meet a Need book club that I wanted to talk about a little bit is the Autism Society of Minnesota book club. The Autism Society of Minnesota goes by the acronym AUSM or AWESOME, which I particularly like. Um, and this book club is a partnership between them and the Dakota County Library. So the Dakota County Library in Minnesota wanted to make the library more friendly to people on the autism spectrum. At the same time, Awesome had seen an interest in reading among their constituents. Um, they had been hearing that people with autism um, enjoyed reading, especially because it helped them calm down and self-regulate when they got upset. So Awesome connected the library with a local special ed teacher who had uh, lots of experience working with um, autistic patrons, and they started the book club. It's designed for people 14 and older, but the, uh, it mainly serves teens and young adults 
who are learning to live, live more independently and are starting to age out of services. Uh, one thing I really liked about this book club is it shows how you can make changes to a book club over time and that there's no failure in, in those changes. Um, you're not expected to get everything right the first time, and they really embody that. At first, the Awesome Book Club um, tried reading the same young adult book. So every member would read a YA book, come in and discuss it. But they found that for many of the members, that YA book was too advanced of a reading level, and for others, it wasn't advanced enough. So they tossed that out and tried something else. And now their format is each meeting is a part book discussion and part book selection. So members vote at the beginning of the school year on a list of genres that they want to read each month. And each month readers can pick any book that they want to read. When they get together in their meeting, they start by sharing five things about their book that they liked, didn't like, or learned. Then they all split up and the book club members work one-on-one -on -one with either the facilitator of the book club, who is a special ed teacher, or library staff to pick their next book. So they talk about their likes, their interests, um, they look at the computer catalog together, and they find the book on the shelves. Um, all of which, of course, is teaching them not only information literacy skills um, and learning to navigate the library, but social skills as well. Next, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite chapters, which was Get Quirky. This was sort of the, uh, this chapter got all the oddball book clubs that didn't quite belong anywhere else, um, and it was super fun to write. So I'm gonna tell you about a couple of my, uh, the book clubs from that chapter. The first is Boneyard Bookworms. Boneyard Bookworms is a monthly book club run by a pair of cemeteries in the Philadelphia area. There is no library involved. Um, but I think it would work beautifully, actually, in a library cemetery partnership. Uh, Boneyard Book Bookworms has been meeting since 2011. They meet monthly on Thursday evenings on the cemetery grounds. They either meet inside the historic buildings or in the funeral home. I asked the cemetery administrator who organizes the book club what a cemetery book club reads, and she said, more death-related books than the average book club. <laughs> so this month they're reading They Came Like Swallows, by William Maxwell, which takes place during a deadly flu epidemic in 1918. Um, sometimes the group reads books connected to people that are actually buried in the cemetery and they visit their graves, which I found really interesting. One month they read Close to Shore, which is a book about the Jersey Shore shark attacks of 1916. I believe the ones that inspired Jaws. Um, and the club got in their cars and drove out and visited the burial site of the shark attack victim who was buried there. I think this would just be a great way to explore local history and draw connections to literature. And I think the cemetery definitely counts as a unique location. <laughs> Donuts and Death, this is another great one. Um, this book club was created by Conrad Stump. He is the local history associate at the Springfield Green County Library in Springfield, Missouri. And he is also a horror fiction fan. So I think that Conrad did two really clever things with this book club. First, he recognized a population of readers that was going unserved, and he found a way to bring them together. He noticed that there was really nothing in his area for horror fiction readers, for him personally, and for the others that he knew were out there, and so he started this book club for them. And second, he brought his meetings out of the library and into a donut shop near the Missouri State University. Um, he thought that would be a fun place to meet. It's a fun, kitschy atmosphere. Um, everybody piles into one big booth, and if they don't all fit in that big booth, they pull some chairs up. Um, it's really, it, he wanted it to appeal to younger readers and college students nearby. Um, at the start of each meeting, uh, Conrad offers, uh, raffles off a vintage horror paperback that he buys for a dollar or two at a local used bookstore. I thought that was a little fun add-on. And uh, one suggestion, uh, that he gave me was to, to take the time to learn your group's taste. Um, in, in his group, in Donuts and Death, Conrad has learned, they do not want to read about gore or violence toward women, and I better not choose a book where a dog dies, he says. Great, so um, this is Stephanie again, and Meet Them Where They Are was another one of my favorite chapters. Um, one of the biggest challenges I faced as a book club facilitator is consistent attendance. 
By holding meetings in locations where people are already frequenting, you're able to reach people who wouldn't come to the library for a more traditional book club. So Fairy Tales is a partnership between the Washington State Ferries and the local public library. It meets on the commuter ferry between Seattle and Bainbridge Island. And while most of the members are commuters, one elderly woman started riding the ferry every month just for the book club. So she would go into Seattle and have drinks and, and dinner and then get on the ferry and come back um, with all of the commuters just to join the discussion, which I thought was really lovely. I have to admit, as someone who used to be a huge Grey's Anatomy fan, this book club seems so romantic to me. I, I love the idea of providing programming for an audience who can't leave. Um, that's often so much of our issue with library programming, right? It's getting people into the building and then, you know, keeping them there for your, uh, keeping them captive for your uh, program. Um, but, you know, for this particular setting, um, they're stuck on the ferry and this is just a great way to pass the time. I commute to work every day in my car, but if I commuted on a ferry or on another form of public transportation, I think attending a book club during that time would be awesome. Um, and then on a more uh, serious note, um, the, one of the other um, book clubs that I really enjoyed uh, learning about was the Cancer Center Book Club. And that's a partnership between the Santa Barbara Public Library and the Ridley Tree Cancer Center Resource Library. Um, so the book club members include cancer patients, caregivers, and survivors. It's an opportunity for people going through similar experiences to connect about something other than cancer, and the librarians make sure to pick books that um, focus on topics not related to illness or um, anything that uh, might come up um, in their daily life already, so just sort of a way to escape um, from what they're currently going through. And I know firsthand how important it is to feel normal when someone in your family is going through something so awful. It's hard to connect with your regular circle of friends who haven't had experience with cancer. And this book club allows patients and caregivers a chance to do something fun and non-medical while also connecting with people who understand exactly what they're going through. So all of the examples that we've shared today um, were very unique book clubs. But if you're looking for a tried and true way to update your own book club, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Start with something that works well in many communities, like a book club in a bar. Um, we received many submissions for each of these types of book clubs because they work really well in all types of communities. Uh, Sarah has a few examples that she wanted to share um, for book clubs that she wrote about in our book. Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, I think um, we, like Stephanie said, we heard a lot of responses um, from people with great book clubs that sort of fell into these five major themes. Um, one that stuck out, stood out to me is the uh, Read and Greet book club. Um, it is sort of a variation on the book club in a bar. Um, it's, the book club is run by Schenectady County Public Library in Schenectady, New York. Uh, turns out uh, downtown Schenectady, I was not aware, but they right now have a thriving restaurant scene. So the library created a book club that hops, hops around to sample new restaurants. Um, there are a few things that as a librarian you want to know going into a situation like that. So the, the librarian who runs the Read and Greet book club first attends the restaurant as a customer. She just goes herself for dinner just to size up the atmosphere, um, see what the noise level is like. If a restaurant is way too loud, way too boisterous, you're not going to be able to hear each other. She marks it off the list. Um, I believe she also knows that her uh, constituents, you know, are interested in the good beer list. So she, she looks for a good, good menu that will suit their needs. Um, if it feels like a good fit, she talks in person to the restaurant staff. She'll go during off hours, like earlier in the day when the restaurant is bound to be quiet and talks in person to the manager. Um, turned out she started originally sending emails. She thought that would be a better way just to lay out exactly what she was looking for in the, the restaurant situation. And that didn't work out for her. She said, take it from me, go in person. So um, she asks for a private or a semi-private room where they can turn down the music. Um, and they also need separate checks. And other than that, she said, 
so what she's learned over the past months and years of doing this is just to stay flexible. Um, at first, she said they would walk into a restaurant or bar and the tables wouldn't be set up right or it would be too cold in there and she would be trying to sort of micromanage every bit of, of the book club meeting and she, turned, she finally had to just sort of throw up her hands and say, it's not going to be exactly the way I want it to be and that's okay. Um, it's the experience of going to a new location, talking about the book in a different setting, experiencing new foods and drinks. Um, so be flexible. And I also wanted to mention the pre book, the pre pub book club. This one's kind of a fun one. Uh, clubs without required reading. We heard from a lot of people that are doing this and it's a really smart way to cut down on your prep time. Um, they're often called reading circles. Uh, people will just bring whatever book they're currently reading, whatever is sitting on their nightstand at that time. And it's uh, more of like a reader's advisory, um, beating up your own reading list. So the uh, Commerce Township Community Library in Commerce Township, Michigan, sort of has a play on this. She, the librarian who created this had a ton of advanced reader copies that she didn't know what to do with. You can't put them in the book sale necessarily because they can't be sold. She did, had too many to keep for herself. So she started a book club for, with them. Um, the librarian does a little presentation about what each uh, advanced reader copy, uh, what the plot is about. They also talk about the marketing plan. Um, she said you can tell a lot of things about, you know, even the paper and the cover of the book and the marketing plan that is sent along with it. Um, and the book club participants are really interested in that. So she does a little presentation about the book, then everyone grabs the book that they're interested in, takes it home, and the next month they come back and just share a little bit about that book before diving into the new batch of advanced reader copies. And I thought that was just such a smart idea to use up all the galleys that are piling up <laughs> that, that we might not be able to get to, but other people would really be interested in. Um, and finally, I just wanted to note um, celebrity book clubs. There's no shame in using a celebrity book club. You might not get the celebrity there, I mean, but you can certainly read what they're reading and use the discussion questions that they put um, on their websites. Um, looking at you, Sarah Jessica Parker. Um, so, you know, that's another way just to make your life a little bit easier and it also adds a little bit of um, uh, name recognition to your marketing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I also wanted to point out another book club that we feature um, that kind of bridges the gap between the cookbook club and the clubs without required reading. Um, and that's the BYO Books Dessert Discussion Group. Um, so that book club meets in uh, Vermont and they, they have 10 regular book club members that range in age from their mid-20s to their early 90s. And they get together every month um, to discuss books and participate in a uh, friendly competition potluck um, in the hopes of winning the most delicious on the table award. Um, and so for that book club, um, they all read whatever they like um, and they bring some sort of dessert that they've created from a cookbook. Um, and then they compile all of the reviews um, of the books that they've discussed into a 70-page um, collection of book reviews um, in like a magazine-style publication. Um, and they actually put it out for the patrons in the library. So if people are coming in looking for um, a recommended book, they can pick up this little magazine and find out what all of the book club members are reading. That's a fun one. That, that reminds me of another one that we featured called The Feast. Um, and this is a book club at Huntsville Madison County Public Library in Huntsville, Alabama. And it's mostly online. Um, the Feast is a Facebook group, which you can visit. It's facebook.com slash group slash The Feast Downtown. Um, and for most of the year, the club is just a, mem you know, a Facebook group where people are sharing recipes and um, funny old articles about uh, food and whatnot, um, but four times a year they get together in person to do um, a potluck. And it's held in the library. The staff takes a lot of time and fixes up one of the meeting rooms into a cozy dinner area with, with electric candles and whatnot. Um, and each dinner is themed. Um, so for example, one potluck asked each member to bring a dish from a different country so they would have a really diverse menu. Um, another theme challenged members to cook any recipe by a certain author um, who focused on Southern cuisine. So they had an array of Southern cuisine to, to sample.
And with that, I think we want to open it up for questions. Um, we went a little quickly, so we have uh, some time. So if you have any questions for us, please drop them in the chat box now. Um, we'll give you a few minutes. Um, we will also put up the book information. I know that some people were asking for the discount code. <laughs> Great question. Victoria had a question. And Stephanie, I leave this one to you since I do not technically work in a library. <laughs> Where did the library get the advanced reader copies? Yeah, so um, as a librarian, um, I get advanced reader copies at conferences a lot. Um, if you visit any of the publishing table, uh, publishing booths in the exhibit hall, you can pick up advanced reader copies. You can also get on mailing lists for publishers, and a lot of times they'll send boxes of books to your library, um, and that's a great way to um, you know, uh, use those advanced reader copies. Um, and I know too some bookstores get advanced reader copies, so if you have a local bookstore um, you know, in your town, perhaps you can you know, partner with them and they might be able to provide you with some of those books as well. Um, and just sort of a fun uh, fact from me, when I was a teenager, I was a part of an um, advanced reading copy book club, and my librarian would get these advanced reader copies, and then um, we would all get to pick one and read about it, and then come in the next month and, um, and share our thoughts about the book. And then she used those opinions uh, to decide whether or not she was going to purchase the book for the library. So it was a really fun way to feel like you were a part of you know, the behind the scenes um, library task. Thanks, Victoria. That was a good question. Um, Elizabeth has a question, and it is, budget-wise, how does the public library handle a meeting in outside locations? Do you budget for renting rooms? And Stephanie, I can answer this um, first, and then if you have anything to add, you can sort of jump in. Sure. I, um, none of the librarians I talked to paid for their rental, for their book club meeting locations that I'm aware of. Um, everyone that I spoke with told me that they just struck a deal with, you know, they just talked in person with the, the manager of the restaurant or the um, staff person at the um, state park, and they were happy to open their doors to the library. It really is beneficial for both parties. Um, one book club that I wrote about was a partnership between a library and a state park, and they alternated locations. So they would meet one month at the library, one month at the state park building. And that just gets people familiar with both spaces. It gets people to know the resources from both spaces. Um, so it's really a win-win. And in terms of meeting in a restaurant, I mean, they're, they're getting the business. So really, um, they didn't find the need. The librarians they spoke to didn't see the need to pay a rental ever. Um, they do pick nights that are less busy. So they um, often opted for, say, a Tuesday night as opposed to a Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. Um, so the noise level would be a little lower. And yeah, they said just go talk to the folks there and explain what you're looking for. Um, oftentimes they'll offer you, you know, that, that private room. Yeah, I think um, I think you answered that question really well. Um, and I would say that you're, I mean, you are bringing that business to, um, to that local establishment, and then those your book club members might go back there. They might have had such a great time at your book club that then they bring a bunch of friends the next weekend, and so you're really kind of building a relationship with that, um, either the bar or the restaurant, um, and I think it's sort of a win-win for everybody. And Tony makes a good point to that. Um, he said, regarding using facilities outside the library, if business, stress your marketing, what they will get from it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. If you're going to have the book club meeting at a certain restaurant and that's going to go into your library's program booklet or um, marketing brochure, then certainly bring that up. That's all good marketing for them. So um, oh, let's see. Oh, I, there, I see there's a question about the Bring Your Own Book um, Club from Anne. Um, and so how it would work is everyone can kind of read whatever book they like that month, and then they come to the meeting and they discuss the book that they read. So some of our, um, some of the people that we either featured in the, in the book or who sent us submissions mentioned that they had like everyone would sit around in a circle and everybody got, you know, three to five minutes to talk about their particular book. 
Um, so I think it's more of kind of a sharing opportunity, like a show and tell. This is what I read. Um, this is what I liked about it. This is why you should read it or why you shouldn't. And then I think once everyone's had a chance to go around, they kind of open it up to a wider discussion. So if people have questions about certain books or if they want to kind of talk about um, just books in general or, or whatever else they want to discuss. Tony um, asked a question about online book clubs. He said they've tried Facebook Live, which didn't work well. Um, now they're trying GoToMeeting. And he asked about other platforms we should consider. Um, most of the people I talked to that run online book clubs or that had some component of their book club online liked Goodreads. Um, Stephanie, mm -hmm. do you, would you agree with that? Yes, I think um, that's a good platform. And Sarah and I were also on a panel at ALA with, um, with Anna Ford, who runs the book club's website, and that's with a Z. And that's also another great platform that online book clubs can use, because there's an opportunity for people to vote for what book they want to, uh, oh, thank you, Sarah, um, what book they want to read. Um, you can keep track of everything that you've read. I think there's a section for kind of like a discussion within that website. Um, and so that, that might be a good resource to check out as well. And then I see April um, asked a question about the book to movie book club. Um, so that's a great question. She's asking if you show the movie at the book club um, or if there's another format that people typically use. Um, so we, there was a few people that submitted entries for uh, book to movie book club. I think it kind of varies. So some people, um, their book club would read a book that was about to come out um, as a movie. So they'd read the book, then they'd meet at the library, um, discuss the book, and then do sort of a group field trip to the movies. I know that might not be um, feasible, depending on where you're located. Um, if the movie theater isn't right in town, if you have to go somewhere else, that might not be an option. Um, we, I think we talked to one library who, um, they might not have been a library, I think it might have been a private book club, where they met at different members' houses. So they would all read a book um, and then meet at someone's house to watch the movie, uh, movie version and then kind of discuss. Um, and I think it can be kind of done in a variety of ways. Um, I think there was a senior book club that met um, every week to discuss like a section of the book, and then on the, at the very last meeting, they would watch the movie. So I think you can kind of get creative um, with how you want to handle that. Oh, and then I see Karen mentioned um, an issue with uh, that a book to movie event might be too long of an event to watch the movie and discuss afterwards. Um, I know that some of our libraries in our system do just movie of uh, movie nights, and then might have like. Um, a guest speaker come and talk about the, a topic that's raised in the movie. Or um, I think it really depends on your availability. So if you're able to have, um, you can perhaps have an after hours event. I know we sometimes will do a movie night on a Friday night. Um, but it really depends on staffing. That's a, you know, that's a question for uh, each individual library. You can maybe do like a Saturday or, or a Sunday or a day when it's not as busy where you can take up the meeting room for, you know, three or four hours. I think it, you can also maybe um, select a movie that's not quite as long. Sometimes you can find uh, movies that are like an hour and a half and then allow a half an hour for discussion, putting you at like a two hour program. I think it really just depends on what your staff availability and room availability looks like. I think that's also something that you could post to the group um, once mm -hmm. you start. I mean, people may have no problem at all with a two and a half hour meeting. Yeah. Um, Anne had a question, how would a coffee shop be as a place to meet? And I think that'd be great. Um, we talked yeah. to a couple of places that did that. Um, and again, it entirely depends on a particularly co particular coffee shop you're looking at. Um, I know if I went to the Starbucks down the street at nine o'clock in the morning, that would be a terrible idea because nobody would be able to hear themselves. And, um, but many coffee shops that, you know, have a, a lower uh, noise level would be a perfect fit for that. And it's also easy to um, have people pay their own way when there's something that's counter service as opposed to a waitress or a waiter coming and taking your order. Mm -hmm. um, meeting at a coffee shop also gives you plenty of fun name ideas, caffeine, something or other, book buzz, 
something or other <laughs> possibilities. Yeah, and I think if you're if you're selecting like a neighborhood coffee shop that's maybe not like you know a Starbucks style where they kind of just want to get people in and out um, unless you're you know staying and continuing to order food. Um, or drinks or whatever. I think sometimes a, a smaller coffee shop there, it might be a little bit quieter, especially if you pick like an off hour, like maybe meeting at two o'clock in the afternoon and, um, or maybe like 11 on a weekday, you know, just kind of uh, playing to those hours. Or you can do maybe an evening and, and do like hot chocolate and tea. Um, I think there's, there's a few options for that. Um, on a similar note, my personal book club, um, one that is not that exciting and not in the book, <laughs> um, was discussing places to meet. And our local coffee shop offered to stay open late one night a week. Um, so we would be the only people in the place. Uh, so that's another option if you're maybe in a small town or have a small business who's looking for extra support. Diane says, we read Crazy Rich Asians. Then a week later, we had a baked potato bar and popcorn and watched, movie, watched the movie at the library. Had to make sure we had the public performance rights. That's a great point. Of course, make sure you have public performance rights for anything you show. Uh, she says, it was fun, but not quite all members attended the movie nights. Any other last questions? If you think of anything down the line, I um, know Stephanie and I are both totally open to getting your emails. Um, please send us any questions or comments you have about the book. We'd love to read them. Um, we will also be at the Association for Rural and Small Libraries Conference in Burlington, Vermont next month. And we will be at the California Library Association Conference in October. So if you're at either of those, please come check us out. Oh, Stephanie has a, oh, I'm sorry. Anne has a good question for you, Stephanie. How do you reach people yeah. in their 20s and 30s? That is a great question. Um, so when I first, uh, I started a 2030 something book club when I was in my early 20s and I started by um, begging all of my friends and my boyfriend, now husband, uh, to come to the meetings. Um, so that kind of built, a, that was a small group of, uh, of five. And then I had, I did actually have like people from the library community coming in as well. Um, I found that the hard part was just picking a night that worked for everyone. Um, so obviously avoiding like Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays because it's just not a good day for, for a younger crowd. Um, I think we did Thursday nights and that worked really well at like 7 or 7.30. Um, so after work, after people have had a chance to like go home and maybe eat dinner or change or whatever. Um, and that was, it was a really fun group. We met, um, I was at that library for, I think I, we ran that book club for about two years before I transferred to another library and it was great. It was really fun. Um, I advertised, uh, I went to a lot of local businesses. So I advertised in like our local coffee shops and um, local uh, like yoga studio and like places where I myself um, would frequent, so like the gym, um, different places like that. I kind of reached out to some local colleges um, where in the community I was working in, there was a couple of community colleges and then we were really close to San Francisco State. So I advertised there. I was also a student at SF State at the time. So I was able to kind of put up flyers and um, chat about it with some of my classmates. Um, I think just kind of knowing where the 20 and 30 somethings in your community are hanging out is a, a good place to start. Um, and kind of like talking to, if you, if you have like a local coffee shop and all the baristas are in their 20s, maybe talk to them and see if they have some ideas for where you might want to advertise. Um, I think also, um, you know, this was about 10 years ago, 10, almost 15 years ago now. So. Um, things have changed a little bit in terms of social media. So now I would definitely um, probably change my approach and add a lot more social media outreach. Um, if your library has like an Instagram account, that's a great way to reach a lot of people in that age bracket. Yeah, I, I definitely echo the Instagram thing. Um, I also just wanted to mention one of the uh, book club leaders that I talked to mentioned how important it was for her and her book club that served 20 and 30 somethings to have sort of an ambassador to the group. So she started with someone that she knew 
who was who she knew through the library who was already in that age group and very active in library sort of circles and that person was basically an ambassador for the book club and started inviting her friends and then got them to bring their friends and it, it sort of grew like that another one talked about um, the poster that they created and hung all over the coffee shops in downtown and it featured a big glass of beer <laughs> so whatever works <laughs> Uh, Victoria's wondering, has anyone used Odillo? I have not. Stephanie, do you have an answer? No, I, ha I haven't used it. I don't uh, remember talking to anyone when we were working on the book that had used it. I think most people were doing like Goodreads or Facebook or um, some of those uh, platforms. Yeah, that's true. If anyone has experience with Odillo, um, it would be great if you just type a few words in the chat box. We can all learn from it. And Kayla uh, just made a comment. She said, we meet at a brewery on the third Sundays at 3. We've been having between 10 and 18 attendees on a regular basis, people from their 20s to their 70s. That's a very nice range. We do themes and provide titles and books for people to check out. That's a great idea. So I think what Kayla is saying is that she brings the books along so that people can check them out on the spot and not make the trip to the library, which is makes things nice and convenient for people. I don't think I've missed any questions, but I'm giving it one final look through. If anyone has any last thoughts, please drop them in the chat box. Okay, I think we will wrap up. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, this has been fun. And feel free to reach out to us at our emails that you see on the screen. And thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, um, and I hope everyone enjoyed the webinar. And if you are going to one of the conferences that we mentioned, we'd love to chat with you, so please stop by and say hi.